Hi, I'm Mark Bunker, and I'm coming to you from sparkling Clearwater, Florida. I haven't turned on the camera and just talked to you in a long time, and I, I thought it was about time I did so again. And I'm going to try to do this more in the coming months. I lived here in Clearwater back in 2000 and 2001 when I worked with Bob Minton at the Lisa McPherson Trust. Spent 10 years away from here in San Diego where I was working in TV news, and I decided that I would come back to Clearwater. Now, the first question everybody always asks me is, why? Why would you do that? Well, I like Clearwater. Uh, and the two years that I spent here in the past were the most interesting years of my life. I always felt an affinity to Clearwater, even before I ever visited the town, having read about how Scientology snuck into town back in the late 70s and targeted Gay, uh, Mayor Gabe Casares. Well, when I lived here back in 2000, I, I got a chance to meet uh, and become friends with Gabe Casares, and uh, that meant a lot to me. Uh, so I'm back here. I'm going to work here to finish up my movie, and um, I thought, you know, I'll set up base here and maybe someday down the road run for public office. I think that would be fun. Wise beard mayor. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you today because lots of exciting things have been going on since I moved back here. Some of those you've probably already heard about. Um, I moved here a couple of months ago. A couple of days after I moved in, I had a knock on the door. And it was my neighbor, Judy, lives right next door to me here. Judy was a very friendly, bubbly person and invited me into her place. And, and uh, I graciously uh, went in and sat down with her. And we, we talked for like 10 or 15 minutes, a lot of small talk, you know. Uh, what it's like living here in the complex and the neighborhood and the weather and, you know, kitties and dogs and stuff like that. Uh, I saw after about 10 or 15 minutes that she had a, a bookcase full of Scientology material. And I, I thought, well, okay, I better be upfront about this. And I told her, listen, Judy, I, I have to be honest with you. I am what Scientology would call an SP. I've been working on this documentary about Scientology. I've been interviewing a lot of former members and a lot of former executives and people who have been touched in one way or another by Scientology, and I just wanted you to know that. Judy's face, her expression changed abruptly when I said that. Prior to this, she had been so bubbly and, and was offering me a chair or a table if I needed some furniture before the movers arrived here. and, and uh, as soon as I said, uh, you know, I'm an SP, her face went... And uh, she very quickly said, well, if that's the case, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I'm happy to talk at all, any time, and I, I hope we can be friends. And she just said, I'm, I have to ask you to leave now. And I said, absolutely, I understand. Um, I said to her, listen, uh, you know, you're going to talk to Scientology about this and, and uh, you know, they're going to tell you all sorts of horrible things about me. I'm actually kind of a nice guy and, I, you know, uh, but in any case, the, they may want to set up surveillance equipment in your apartment, you know, put microphones on the walls or something like that. If they try that, let me know about it. And she said, they would never do a thing like that. Anyway. I left. I haven't seen Judy since then. It's been a few months. Um, in fact, I haven't seen you know anybody living next door. The Christmas direction, uh, the uh, Christmas decorations are still up on the door, and it's February now. So I, I'm afraid she may be too afraid to live here next to an SP. Or Scientology actually did set up a cyber center right behind these walls to to monitor me at all times. One way or the other, I don't care. But a couple of days after my conversation with Judy, I heard that the um, condo association here, I'm renting a condo. Um, by the way, it's right across the street from Hacienda Gardens, and I had no idea. When I moved to town here, I rented this online, had never seen the place before I arrived here in town. Just the photos that were on the website. Well, one night, late at night, I was pulling into the parking lot here, and I saw a flag bus going into the lot across the street. I thought, well, what the heck's going on over there? And when the lights came up the next day, when the sun came out, I, I, I took a look, and yes, it's Scientology Sea Org birthing uh, Hacienda Garden. So 
I'm right across the street. That was not my plan. I'm sure Scientology is thinking, oh my God, oh my God, he purposely moved there for that. Anyway, um, a few days after my talk with Judy, uh, the Condo Association let me know that Scientology had delivered this big stack of legal documents to them, demanding that I be evicted because I was in breaking, breaking an injunction being within 10 feet of Judy. Now, this is silly, but uh, the condo association was, was you know, pretty amused and, and chagrined that they would actually try something like this. And say, they said, don't worry, we're not going to do anything about it. But I started thinking about it, and I thought, well, we should try to do something about this. Um, this injunction, the, the, the reason that uh, all of this happened is because there is a, a permanent injunction in place from the LMT days. Uh, it started uh, back in, I think, even late 99, where Bob Minton um, was picketing outside the Fort Harrison Hotel here, and he had been followed all day long by Scientologists. He had flown in that day from Boston. They were at the airport in Boston with, with signs protesting him in the airport. When he arrived in, clear, in Tampa, rather, they were there pestering him, and they were, they were following him along all day long, and, and he was you know, really fed up with it. So that night, Richard Howd, the uh, cameraman from Scientology, was getting in his face, and Bob was trying to make a phone call, and Bob took his protest sign and kind of pushed him away, and the sign hit Richard Howd in the face, and he went, wow, 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 and spun around and collapsed to the ground, and, and they charged Barb, uh, Bob with a, a assault, and Bob had to stand trial. Now, Bob's attorney is top flight, we, we have this incredible defense attorney here, criminal defense attorney, uh, Dennis DeFlaming, who did a terrific job in a couple of situations with Bob. And he also came up to Chicago to defend me when I was arrested when I uh, flew up there to interview two married dentists who had been defrauded out of $100,000 by Scientology. For two years, this couple had been trying to get $20,000 back from the church that they had paid in advance for courses. And, uh, and they left and they said, we want that money back. And Scientology gave them the runaround for two years. They called us at the LMT. I flew up there to interview them. I arrived with them at the Chicago org and was trying to do a little bit of interview with them. Two thugs in black leather jackets came running out of the door, passed the two dentists, grabbed me by either arm, and arrested me for trespassing on a uh, public sidewalk. You may have heard me talk about this before. I, I babble about it quite often. Um, these officers, it turned out when we, we, we went to trial over this, these officers had been hired by Scientology, and they had been waiting there in the org for a couple of hours before we arrived. And Scientology was hyping them up about how dangerous I am, how, uh, you know, how how desperately serious this is that this, this criminal is coming here to cause harm. So the second I arrived, they were ready for action, and they just came out and hauled me away. Well, Dennis DeFlaming came up to Chicago and ably defended me up there. Uh, and the jury, in a half an hour, found me not guilty, and, and, and that was all over. It, it was exciting. But what Scientology wants to do is be able to say that I'm a criminal. L. Ron Hubbard wrote that anyone who criticizes Scientology is a criminal, and all they have to do to shut them up is dig up their crimes. And if you can't find any, manufacture them. So that's what Scientology always tries to do. Get you arrested, you know, and, and provoke you, get you to, you know, uh, swipe, you know, swat back at them, and then haul you into court. By the time I had returned to Chicago from my arrest, uh, two days later, Scientology already had a copy of my mug shot and was showing it off to every business in the area, saying, watch out for this guy. He's dangerous. You know, you've got to be careful around him. That's how they operate. So because of the incidents with Bob, um, there has been this injunction that was put in place. And it's a two-way injunction. Uh, Bob and all the members of the LMT and everybody working in concert with them were supposed to keep 10 feet away from all Scientologists and away from their properties. Uh, a picket-free zone was established around several of their buildings here in, in Clearwater. And conversely, all Scientologists were supposed to stay 10 feet away from us and away from our property. Well, the way it turned out is it only applied to us because 
we were served. There was just a handful of us, and Scientology had their people there is serving us officially. So we were covered by it. But there's thousands of Scientologists here in Clearwater. There's no way we could afford to serve each and every Scientologist. So therefore, it applies to us, it doesn't apply to them. And we're not, we're not going to be calling the police and saying, listen, they, they came up into my, uh, into my face and got in my grill. Please stop them. So it really was only ever used against us. Now, everybody else from the LMT is gone. And after 10 years of being in San Diego, I'm back here now. So the injunction really is for me, <laughs> solely me. And I'm the one person who's never broken the injunction, and I, I never will break the injunction. Specifically because it, it has to do with picketing. There are areas where you can picket. You can walk through those areas if you don't have a picket sign, or if you do and you just put it down by your side. But if you just happen to walk down that block with your sign at your shoulder, you're going to be arrested or ticketed. And, you know, they're, they're going to take you to court over that. Expressly in the injunction, it says this does not apply to filming. So I always filmed the pickets. I was never really protesting. I was just there filming. I've never broken the injunction, and I never will, really. We thought, since Scientology was using this to, to get me evicted, that this would be a good time to actually take this back to court and say, Judge, there's really no need for this anymore. Can we just dissolve this? You know, if, there, if there's ever anything in the future that, that, that causes problems, it's, all, it's ready made. You can just put it in place again. But for now, there's no need for it. We thought it might be a fairly simple thing to do. Um, but nothing with Scientology in, in the court system is simple. You know, what they want to do is drag you into court, bleed you dry financially, and, and you know, just use the court, as L. Ron Hubbard wrote, to destroy you. So I was very wary about doing this, but I thought it was time to do this, particularly because in the past 10 years when the LMT was no longer in existence and none of us were in town, the injunction was still being used against anybody who came to town to protest Scientology. You know, when Anonymous was here, they were calling the police and saying that these people have to, be, have to live by the injunction. And from my understanding, the police we're actually using that injunction to, to keep protests, you know, stand, going by those standards. This gave Scientology their own special zone of protection that no other individual or business or religion or any, anything else here in town has. They have their own permanent buffer zone if this is to, to stay in place. It doesn't seem right to me. Just a couple of days ago, uh, I saw rumors uh, or, or news stories of a big new Catholic molestation uh, story kicking up. Now, if people wanted to protest the Catholic Church here, they have the right to do so. The Catholic Church doesn't have a buffer zone, nor should they, nor should science, Scientology. So I thought, well, maybe this, uh, maybe this would be worthwhile to go back to the judge and say, let's get rid of this. So I hired Dennis DeFlaming to handle this. And I put out a call on GoFundMe for people to, to donate to the defense fund to, to get this taken care of. Again, not for me, but for anyone else who wants to protest. And you folks came through. You donated about 1800 bucks to this defense fund, and I, I really appreciate that. Yesterday, Dennis DeFlaming and I went to the police station, and we sat down with the chief of police and Rob Surrett uh, from legal and uh, s several other people from the police department. And we had um, you know, a nice discussion about this. Dennis was saying that, listen, there's no need for this anymore. We should just drop this for now. We'd like you to, to support us in that. And again, if, if anything ever happens, you can always pull it out and put it back into place no, with no problem. The police, as I expected, said, we like it. It works perfectly. There's absolutely no reason to get rid of it, and we're going to enforce it. That was what I expected to happen, but I had hoped 
that perhaps reason could prevail. For the police, it's simple. They have, they have the, the ready set of uh, rules that uh, they can just say, hey, this is what you got to do. There's no reason for them to have it taken away. So we were a little, little disappointed by that. We, we tried to argue that, listen, this is, this is only for me. <laughs> you know, this, the, 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 this, is, this is silly. But they wouldn't change their mind. Um, Rob Surratt, as I had mentioned in, 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 as I was talking to them, that I've heard from people that I've never met or never really talked to before, that they had been, um, they had been stopped from protesting or threatened with arrest because of the injunction. And Rob Surratt said, absolutely not. It has never happened. It is only for the named individuals in here. And the officers know that. They've been trained on that. I guarantee that's never happened. Now, I think it has. So if, if anyone out there has had a situation with the injunction, feel free to, to write me at markbunker at gmail.com and, and let me know. What we're planning to do right now, Dennis and I uh, talked about this today. We, he uh, put together a motion, which I've given to Tony Ortega, so he'll have that up on his blog. You'll have a chance to read it. We, uh, we were about to set a court date. We, we have to go in, in front of a judge in St. Petersburg because that's where it initially was put in, into place. Uh, there has been a judge assigned to the case. Wally Pope from Scientology's legal staff said, listen, we're going to need time to bring in a whole slew of witnesses to show how dangerous Mr. Bunker is. And you know, they're going to be talking about the fact that I was arrested in Chicago. I'm a dangerous, horrible person who's tramp, you know, trespassing on their property. They're going to say I was arrested in, in, um, at Gold, their desert compound, when they put me under citizen's arrest, which was silly, and the, the police never charged me with anything and you know, let me go. So they're going to paint me as this horrible, evil monster. And, um, you know, we're actually unlovable, <laughs> you know, so so it's going to be um, hard going, especially with the police saying we like this. We want it to remain in effect. So chances are the judge will probably say, no, nah, we'll leave it in place. So this is where we are right now. Our feeling is that we should just put it on the table for now and, and not go forward at this time. And I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, you know, they're, they're, besides you know, all the witnesses they have against me, they'll, they'll be hauling me in for depositions and they'll be trying to find out the names of everybody who donated to the defense fund and then they'll be poking into the movie and all this kind of, and they'll be able to you know, go into everything you know, the way Scientology does. So at this point, it seems like it's probably best to set this aside for now and tell the judge that it, 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 Scientology through, uh, through Wally Pulp told the police department yesterday and the police told us that they're not going to try to have me evicted here. Um, and if I decide to move to another place, they promise not to try to have me evicted there. And if I'm out in a grocery store in a, in a line and there's a Scientologist next to me, they're graciously not going to call the police to have me arrested. So they're not going to pull any, you know, any of these type of pranks again. Of course, they're still going to try to, you know, to have me arrested every chance they can. But at this point, it's probably best for us to pull back and say, let's see what else they try to pull. And if, and if they do pull more, then we'll take it back to court and go through all the hell that they're going to put me through. Now, we raised about $1,800 for the defense fund, and that's why I wanted to ask you, for those of you who donated, uh, tell me what you want to do, uh, to do with the money. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to, to refund it to you. If you want to keep it here in the defense fund, so if we go down the road again um, in a few months and do it, uh, it's there. Or if you want to put it toward the defense fund for the movie, that would be good too. Uh, but it's up to you. If, if, if you want the money back, uh, I'd be happy to refund it to you. Again, my, my email address is markbunker at gmail.com, so feel free to contact me. Um, 
I, I have uh, Marty up here on the screen here because uh, when I uh, interviewed him for uh, Knowledge Report, we talked a little bit about the LMT years. And I told you that, you know, on the stand, Scientology would paint me as this, this horrible villain, you know, Moriarty to their Sherlock. Um, when I met Mike Rinder for the first time here and sat down after he had left Scientology, I said, how did Scientology view me? Because, listen, I'm Mark Bunker. I have all these videos on the web. I'm, I'm a big threat. And uh, Rinder said, you know, frankly, we never really thought about you. You were always the friendly, amiable guy, the camera guy who always waved to the camera and said, hello. <laughs> yeah, so we thought nothing of you, which was, you know, a little deflating. But, you know, it's a nice stark contrast between how they really viewed me and how they're happy to portray me in the courtroom or to the media or to anyone who will listen. So I've got a little clip here of Marty Rathbun. We talked about the LMT years and what it was like when the LMT came to town. And I'd like to show you that clip right now. Well, it's interesting you put it that way. I mean, Mike and I were in a different scenario. We were in a wing of offices with Miscavige. And um, I mean, even if he were back in, in LA where he wouldn't be able to go by and see it or, you know, have to avoid it in order to go to his movie or to go to the Fort Harrison, it would, might have been different. I mean, it was really difficult for us because, you know, he's, he's one of those people that's like, you know, um, he's just in your face nonstop, 24-7 until you guys are gone. So it was pretty, in other words, the LMT coming to town created something that was a horror story for me and Mike Rinder and for Office of Special Affairs flag. In other words, it didn't really bother me too bad that you all moved in next door to the, but what, <laughs> what the problem was, it drove Miscavige stark staring mad and, and, and Mike Rinder and I on a daily basis had to suffer the brunt of that reaction. And it was constant. You know, you talk about, you know, breaking the law. I mean, he didn't care how it got done. I want them out. You know, we tried to buy the place out from under you. We went and got, got with the owner and tried to do it. Um, you know, we bought essentially the, the uh, Clearwater Police Department. No, no, no expense spared. It didn't matter. I mean, police, the, the Clearwater Police Department, you know, had, 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 was probably the biggest enemy of the Church of Scientology. Ex still extant by the late 90s. And uh, we basically bought them by, by hiring virtually every one of their officers on an off-duty basis, double time, triple time, where we were at the gravy train for them. And I think you experienced it yourself where that had a, a, an effect within months. Um, I mean, we did, you know, we were down seeing the city attorney, we were down seeing the uh, city manager on almost a daily basis, you know, demanding there's something to get done to get you guys the hell out of there. Um, so, so yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty rough. What was the reaction of the, the the city officials when you would be there, harassing them? When we or would what now? When you would be there to pressure the city manager, and what would be their reaction to it? What? Well, it was kind of interesting because they were um, they were played in a real manipulative way. And, and Miscavige did it, and it was it was fairly clever um, and fairly devious, though. But he was constantly um, holding this threat out that it was this clear water was like a powder keg, um, and that it could explode at any moment. You might have recalled that we staged that um, march with five thousand or three thousand, or it was a, quite a number of Scientologists on the St. Pete Times. Yeah, um, and uh, which is another whole interesting story in itself. The one with the Nazi uniforms? No, no, that was the Guardian's office earlier on. This is the oh. one that said, Sid Klein, what's your crime? Oh. Who he was the thing. It was, on the, it was on the Clearwater Police Department and on the St. Pete Times. It was in 98, I think, um, or 99. And uh, anyway, so Miscavige used this whole thing with Roberto and the city attorney about how, um, 
you know, that's just the beginning. That was just a small group and this whole town could explode and this is some crisis about to happen. And so they were really worried about uh, us turning it into a, you know, religious freedom crusade and a, making it a national issue and, you know, exacerbating the whole thing. And, uh, and so that's how they, they kind of took it. They took it sort of in a fear. You know, he painted a, a convincing picture of how this cat powder cake could go off at any moment and every minute that they allowed the, the hate group, McPherson Trust, to be in town um, brought us that much closer to the keg almost exploding. So I'm back here in Clearwater and I'm going to keep speaking out uh, about Scientology fraud and abuse and I want to thank you for all of your support over the years. Uh, I promise to come back here and talk to you more frequently and let you know how Knowledge Report is going. I know you want to know when it's going to be finished. I do too. I'm, I'm not going to tell you a date right now because every time I've done that I've been wrong but one of the, the reasons for moving back here is to, to concentrate on getting the film done. And It'd be fun not to, to run for mayor as well. So there's that. Anyway, until next time, thanks for listening. I'm Mark Bunker, and we'll see you at Xenu TV.